cat, you went complaining to your parents, you should actually, all these sort of issues. Why? Because we don't have a central authority that is radiating for everybody the same values. And this is the real challenge that the Muslim community need to encounter. And sometimes I say to myself, the one who should be replacing Rasulullah today as an authority should be the ulama, should be the uh, imams in the masjids, should be uh, the teachers, should be the coaches, the personal trainers. We should create this kind of an awareness. And I know it would not replace as if it were the Prophet Sallallahu but at least it will multi multi create this kind of multiplicity of different authorities and on the long run it will create that kind of an awareness. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Jazakallah. Another um, issue within society and I'm sure there's been probably um, sayings and incidents where the Prophet Sallallahu advised us on balance and um, we are so overwhelmed and, and, and taken over by school and um, extramural and activities and um, having to fit into society and um, even the madrasa is not there anymore as what it used to be back in our day. We're going every afternoon after school to madrasa. Um, it has become non-existent in a way. So that balance of not seeing your, your parents often. We used to have a ritual of going to you know granny and grandpa once a week or over weekends. But, but the, the children are so overwhelmed with homework and projects and then there's extramural. What did the Prophet Sallallahu advise us? And I know there's always, always a, there was always advice on, on moderation. But uh, yeah, in his life, what was his advice on you know, balance and time and responsibilities? What, what, what was important? Sister Hawa, th this is, this is a, a, again a very fasc fascinating question. And because it's, 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 it's extremely difficult, even we as adults, mm -hmm. we actually struggle with what we today talk about this time management. And again, as we see books on emotional intelligence, there are ample books on also time management. One of the hadith on, in Shama' al-Tirmidhi, uh, one of the books that talks about the characteristics of the Prophet Sallallahu it is said that Rasulullah used to divide his day into three parts. One part, he gives it to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala in terms of dua and ibadah and isolation and meditation, etc. And then the second part, he would give it to his family, including his children, his wives, etc. And then the third part, it would be for himself. For himself meaning, for serving the people, meeting with the companions, etc. So uh, Rasulullah here is giving us one of the much needed skill and that is time management. I think the essence of time management is discipline and commitment to it. Sometimes uh, we, we, we are aware of something, we are aware that we need to wake up early in the morning, but only to go to school. But if it's a weekend, we oversleep. We are aware that we need to go to the gym uh, only because before marriage we go to the gym, but after the marriage we grow a belly. M my point is, I'm sorry, to, maybe this is not an appropriate, but my point is that whenever we, we believe in a particular value, we need to stick to it. Rasulullah that was his schedule, whether he was in his 40s or 50s or 60s. So that's number one. Uh, number two, regarding the, 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 the responsibilities, I agree with you. Today, we, are, we live in a very over-ambitious age. We want to become wealthy. We want our children to become smart. We want them to beca become half of Quran. But at the end of the day, we are overwhelming. It's actually straining our very human relations together. And it's coming at the expense of other things. What's the point if someone becomes a medical doctor, but the expense of not seeing his grandmother for multiple months? My point is that we need to maintain and strike a balance between, yes, we want to be successful, we want to be wealthy, but at the end of the day, we have to also focus on things that do not bring us money necessarily, but brings us emotional credit with our family, such as love, care, sacrifice, empathy, caring for one's elders. It doesn't, our relations do not have to necessarily always be transactional. Like, you know, how much am I giving? How much am I receiving? Now, you asked me about parenting and what, does, what did the Rasulullah did. Inspired by the action of the Rasulullah with the children, you have a lot of scholars that uh, have written in the past about parenting. And a prominent scholar that you usually do not quote in, in, quote in, this, in this parenting, usually it's Imam Ghazali, Abu Hamad al-Ghazali. You usually quote him in Ihya al din Sufi, Tasawuf, etc. But believe it or not, he actually wrote a book about parenting. And one of the things that he says, where he talks about the need to give children a break and allow children that they, after they come from the madrasa, 
they need to be given time to simply play, do nothing but play. He says, because if we don't, we are creating dumb children. We are creating children that are not smart because he believes that playing gives us this time to process what we've learned and it gives our mental. And even today in the books of creativity, they say that the more sometimes you think of a problem, the more you don't find a solution. But if you go and take a shower or go and jog or just go and med meditate, it is here that you will find the solution. It's like this, uh, uh, this person uh, who, 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 had, uh, um, who, who invented the law of uh, floating. What was his name? When did he, how did he uh, come up with this law? While he was having, uh, he filled uh, yeah. the water in the banyu and, he, and then he said, I found it and found, you, you know, Eureka, oh, I found it or whatever. So today people come up with all these kind of ideas. Sometimes I personally, I come I, and I'm just driving my car. I see something that has nothing to do with the problem I was thinking about and then come up with creative solution. My point is that we do not have to always impose on the children and make them victims of our ambition. We get to be children only once. I will only be 13 for one year. After that, I will be 14. Please, let, because if you deny me that now, you will see sometimes that it fires back. People grow up to be depressed or people take time to mature because they are fulfilling their lost and stolen childhood from them. If you talked about moderation, I'm saying other than moderation, justice. Mm -hmm. Let's understand the needs of each each age group and give it. Now, I'm not saying that they neglect their homework. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that they neglect their madrasa. But we need to do it in a way that is subtle, that is balanced, that is moderate, and recognize that they have other needs just then to learn the Quran or make their multiplication or maths equation. Absolutely. So from that has come so many questions, but now I have to quickly kind of stick to the schedule because we have some listeners and our production team that has put uh, together some questions. I'm going to hold on to that just a little bit because you, um, doctors br brought up the, you know, the question around playing, teach your child uh, at a certain age when they're meant to be playing, you know, then a certain age you teach them and then, you know, if they're your friend. So inshallah, we'll move on to that a little bit later on, but to bring up the fact of grandparents. Um, how the Prophet ﷺ was a doting grandfather and um, maybe some examples of how our grandfathers, um, our grandparents rather, today can emulate that, inshallah. So to make a context for that, Rasulullah was a grandfather for seven, seven granddaughters uh, and grandsons or sons and do or girls and boys, four, bo four, four boys and three uh, girls. Mm -hmm. How did he used to deal with them? Actually, again, I mentioned this in my courses. There is a fascinating book that uh, is called How Did He Deal With Them? Specifically talking about Rasulullah and how he, did he deal with various sectors of society. And there is an entire chapter about Rasulullah, the grandfather, and how did he deal with his uh, granddaughters and grandsons. And he gives you this, the author gives you these kind of subtitles. So one of the titles is that he used to joke with them. He used to laugh with them. He used to carry them. He used to carry them for long periods, so much so that them at that time, not wearing nappies, used to urinate on his legs. And he would say, nothing is the matter, no problem. He would, the, he would ask the mother, who would be usually his daughter, the daughter of the prophet, to take the boy. And he would ask for water and he will clean the urine. And that's it. Yeah. End of story. He will allow them even to go to the mosque, something that unfortunately today, um, some mosques in the same way that they ban women, they ban children. So it reminds me of these segregation uh, or, or uh, you know, the, uh, during the 50s and the 60s in, in America, no, no Jews, no blacks, no dogs. Sometimes you have mosques here, no children, no women. But uh, so, so Rasulullah used to allow the children to, and think about it. If a child is not wearing a nappy, nappy and he urinates on the lap of the Prophet, could it be a possibility that this same child who's not wearing a nappy because it was not available in society, could have been urinated in the mosque. But that did not prevent the following day, Rasulullah would not say, children urinate, prevent them from the... No, they would come. They would come and sometimes climb on the back of the Prophet whilst the Prophet is prostrating. And the Prophet would prolong his prayers deliberately until Umama, one of his granddaughters, had had enough of enjoyment. You spoke, uh, we spoke a while ago about the importance of play. Now, please, square this for me. He is praying, and he's leading the prayer in congregation, 
And as we have a schedule in this radio pro program, he had also a schedule to finish the prayer before time. Yet, the prayer is prolonged, not for a reason to do with the companions or ibadah or Allah or the Prophet, but to do with the concerns of a child that has not had enough climbing the back of the Prophet. And after the prayers, the companions are asking, Ya Rasulullah, why did you prostrate for so long? And then he would say, my granddaughter Umama is having fun. Why should I actually interrupt her? I had to wait until she finishes. And then I said, Allahu Akbar, and I ended the prayer. So he used to take them to the masjid. He used to carry them. And he used to advise them also. This is the important role of a grandparent. Sometimes you think of a grandfather as the one who's spoiling the kids, just bringing them candies, etc. And attention happens between the son. My, my, my father, why are you bringing candies? He has just brushed his teeth. And, and th that's why in the books of parenting, they say, let the grandparents spoil your, th their grandson. This is their role in life. Mm -hmm. Because they are now grown older, <coughs> soft-hearted, etc., etc. So, but Rasulullah would also advise and would also give instruction. So one day, uh, Al-Hasan, one of his grand uh, do, uh, sons, uh, ate a date that fell. And... Um, in fiqh, and we are not going to speak here about fiqh, but this is something to be mentioned uh, alongside uh, this example. Al al bayt are not allowed to eat from the sadaqah. Al al bayt for the people of the household of, are not allowed to eat from the sadaqah. Rasulullah is not, no one is allowed to inherit a uh, to, uh, to have inheritance. Mm -hmm. When Rasulullah died, his money was distributed to the poor. Even his wives did not inherit, or his children did not inherit. So he said to Al Hasan, Kikh, kikh, kikh. Kikh, kikh, and you know, says, dirty, dirty, dirty. So even though Al-Hasan could not yet understand haram and halal, Rasulullah spoke to him as a grandfather, the language that babies can understand, by saying, kikh, kikh, don't eat this. Of course, he did not tell him, sadaqa, and we are al al bayt. But of course, he looked to the elders and said, we, al al bayt, are not allowed to eat dates because that date that fell was from the sadaqa. So uh, there is a lot uh, that could be said about the role of uh, grandfathers and uh, Rasulullah is a role model in that. Absolutely. Speaking uh, to the children in their own language as well, we need to take a short break when we continue our last few minutes, uh, last segment with uh, Dr. Hisham getting some of the gems of the life of the Prophet Sallallahu back in a moment. Hope this has all been recorded. Brilliant. No, I recorded hope, or yes, not? that's why I'm just checking. And I, 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 I there's a recording, there's a recording. I worked there's as a recording. journalist, by the way, no, I know. for 10 years, and uh, sometimes I would do an interview and then realize it has not been recorded. <laughs> oh, and, that's the worst. Yes. We've done recordings in a studio, and then it's saved on a laptop and a computer. Mm. We had next week something crashed or something. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, well. Sheikh Ibrahim was, he wasn't happy. Okay, let's just come over here. Okay, so um, something that's not in here that if we have enough time to bring up is um, the very common saying the Prophet Sallallahu said, you know, the first few years play with the child, these few years teach the child, and then these few years be the child friend. I would just like uh, Dr. Isham to comment on that. Mm -hmm. Is that fine? Sure. If we have enough time. Mm -hmm. Because that's the only additional that I have. If we have, let me just ask Joy. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Very good day to you. This is uh, VOC 91.3 FM. I'm Khawa Solomon broadcasting live out in the Borlands on the World Wide Web. Please do tune in on vocfm.co.za. Click on Listen Live and you can hear us wherever you are. Also note to, uh, to the producers as well, you may contact them during your office hours and uh, just check with them which link you can follow. And I think it's iono.fm for any of the shows that you have missed, including this one. And you can download it and listen to it anytime you wish. You have it saved already. So uh, we will continue our conversation with Dr. Hisham Al-Awadi and uh, 
Hails from Kuwait has this very long CV, but we're not going to, inshallah, get into that. We have so, so much important uh, issues to chat about. And uh, beautifully, uh, Doctor spoke about grandparents, 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 and their role in the children's lives, and also elders, how we need to respect and honor them as well. Not the academics and not on the God. So, inshallah, may we take advantage of that time. So, often we use superheroes and the modern um, sort of relevance of what's happening today to our children, these cartoon characters. How can we make Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam relevant and the Sahabas relevant in our lives for our children every day, whether it be a bedtime story, whether it be a story of the Quran? Uh, just elaborate on that, Dr. Isham. It, it, Sister Hawa, this, is, this has been one of my major difficulties and challenges. I cannot compete today as a speaker talking about a seerah. I cannot c compete with Hollywood. I can't mm. compete with the movies that we are being bombarded with on a day-to-day -day basis. Animations, I, you know, on a radio I can't mention certain animations, otherwise I'll be accused of making, you know. I myself, when I take my children to animation movies, and I don't want to mention names here, I am thrilled by the... It's amazing. You know, there is a verse in the Quran that says they know everything that is related to this dunya, but they are so negligent and ignorant of the day of Al-Akhirah. I really, you know, have great faith in this verse, particularly when I watch animation. Why am I saying this? Because they are doing everything with focus, concentration, itqan, perfection. Um, in one of the animation that I saw two weeks ago, they say that one scene uh, took the producer and the actors and the voice makers maybe three, four months to do. This scene, you see it in one minute. Mm -hmm. But it is that one minute that carries all the subliminal messages. And your daughter goes back home, not remembering the entire movie, but remembering that specific minute. You come and compare this to our animation, Islam, Islamic animation. So slow the voices, even sometimes they bring the voice of a girl, the voice of a woman because they don't have enough girls, or the voice of a woman is a young girl because the voice of a woman is haram. All these issues that are creating an imp impediment. And then here I am, a father, coming and saying to my children, uh, we can't go and watch this movie because I'm going to sit down, tell you now the story from the seerah. How can I compete? And with all these movies, there has to be girlfriend, boyfriend, dating, kissing, love, etc., etc. So it's a very difficult question. But one of the things that I do is to try to be equally, as much as I can, as animated as I can, even with my students, even in the courses that I did here in Cape Town and Johannesburg, as much as I can, visual. For example, it was extremely difficult to use PowerPoints like in TED Talks, and I'm sorry here to mention a you know TED Talk, but to you, how, how am I going to use PowerPoints to do with uh, Rasulullah? I, I want to talk about Rasulullah in his twenties and thirties. Okay, so how can I do PowerPoints about the Sira or about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? I met with uh, Mustafa Al Aqad. Mustafa Al Aqad is the director of the Message, uh, and Umar Mukhtar. And of course, he passed away a few years ago. And I met him in London when I was a journalist and I'm working for the BBC World Service at that time. And I said, uh, Mr. Mustafa, how did you make the message? And, 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 you know, what sort of problems and issues? And he said it was extremely difficult. And I said, uh, there is also, you know, you brought Anthony Queen. Uh, Anthony Queen now is dead, and a famous Italian actor. Uh, should you, didn't you fear that people will connect Hamza to Anthony Queen? He said, Hisham, listen, I looked for many, many actors that could play the role of Hamza, even in the Arab world with uh, dark skin, whatever, speak Arabic. But Anthony Queen, uh, you know, regardless of him not being a non-Muslim, he had the charisma, he had the aura. And subhanAllah, a lot of Muslims today know Asira, love Hamza because of Anthony Queen. The point is that sometimes we need to use the tools that have been fortunately or unfortunately founded and innovated by the non-Muslims. So in my PowerPoint, and maybe there is a tip here for teachers, when you teach the seerah, don't necessarily uh, be refrained or embarrassed from using images. You will be if you think about the seerah as personalities. But if you think about the seerah as concepts, ideas, emotions, then you can reduce it 
to an image that reflects that uh, concept or so for example i'll give you an example very simple example uh, may i may i give, give an example yes sure go ahead okay so there is one incident in which uh, rasulullah when he was at the age of 34 uh, encountered a problem the people of mecca were building the kaaba and came to a stumbling block as to which tribe will position the black stone in its position in the Kaaba. And for five days they are arguing and were about to enter into a civil war because they could not come to a solution. And in the process they came up with this idea or solution that the first person who will approach them as they are sitting, they will use him as an arbitrator and see what he thinks. Here you have an issue or a problem where they need someone to think outside the box. And they encounter a Rasulullah who was only 34, not yet a prophet. And he comes up with this creative solution. He brings a cloth and he says, put the black stone in the middle of the cloth. Each tribe now brings forward a representative. Each representative from that, each tribe takes part of the cloth. And we raise the cloth together as if all the tribes raise the black stone. And I'll take the black stone, which was a meter above the ground, and position it in its place. So here you hear the story. When you go to Google and Google the story, you find it all over the place. Click on images and you will find some non-Muslim drawings, literally, of Muhammad Sallallahu in the middle and all the people of Quraysh. And I cannot use this picture. But then I say to myself, why are you telling this story? I am telling this story to encourage the Muslims to be creative to think outside the box and to provide society with services even if that society was non-Muslim. Ah, so here it's about creativity. And here then you have a bingo. You go to Google, you write creativity, you go to images and you have all sorts of wonderful images. You pick up one and you put it as your visual and then you narrate the story. If we can do something like this, now this is just a picture. But maybe you have someone like yourself who's more acquainted with technology, can use a video clip, can use musical impact, can create this sort of a sound effect geared towards creativity. And you tell the story in your own animated, powerful uh, 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 way, but backed up with colors, images and sounds, maybe, just maybe, and you are sincere and genuine and passionate and charismatic, just maybe children will be impacted. Now, from my experience, when children find you genuine and so eager to share a story with them. And of course, they see that you are a role model, not just telling them a story and half an hour after that, you slap them and smack them in the house or you swear at your wife in front of them. When they see you a role model, it really has a great impact on them. And I can definitely vouch as a doctor does hold some awards uh, in 2013 for the innovative lecturer, as well as in 2012, the faculty mentorship. So definitely getting the word out there, mashallah. So with regards to our extended family, we know that they are there, they need to be relevant within our lives. How do they play a role when it comes to raising children? And how rather did they play a role when it comes to raising children at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? So today, the concept of extended family, extended family, and I studied anthropology and sociology as well. Extended family means, technically speaking, and historically means three generations living in a single house. And that usually was the norm 100, 300 years ago when you had an agrarian society where every member of the family was needed. And the more children we have in a household, the better, because they mean they will go cultivate the farm collect the crops and then we can take and sell in the market. But after the Industrial Revolution, of course, uh, men had to migrate to the city, live in little small flats, and of course get married to a girl that he met in a factory or in the neighborhood, and you ended up having the phenomena of a nuclear family, which is usually made of, of one or two generations, of course, the spouse, the spouse, the man and the wife, and a couple, preferably no more than a couple, or maximum three uh, children, because flats back then were, were small. And of course, with that transformation, eroded the values of the extended family. And now we have a challenge, we have a challenge. So where is the extended family? I think, uh, and this is something, and again, I'm not flattering here the people of, of, of the Muslims in South Africa. 
I have met people now uh, who have what we call family businesses. Now, all over the world, including in Kuwait and in the Arab, we have family businesses. But I've seen it here more visible. I have fam I've seen family businesses where you have the entire family holding a business. Now, one of the things that divides members of the family is money and, 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 and interests and, and life and dunya, etc., etc. But you will see these families so much united, so much wealthy, that not only do they prosper in their business, but they make schools, they build mosques. Um, uh, you know, uh, excuse me, um, I'm sorry to, but there's, you know, we, we visited Qur the Qurtuba Academy, for example, a fascinating place where the entire family lives in the academy, but they also have built residential areas, rental areas, they have built a mosque, they have built an academy. So you have this golden role model of what families can do if united together. So my, my, my main message is that extended family is so crucial. Now, in my book entitled Muhammad Sallallahu How He Can Make You Extraordinary, there is an entire chapter about the extended family and the role the extended family played at the life of Rasulullah when a child. So his mother dies at six and then he is taken care of by his grandfather. His grandfather dies when Muhammad Sallallahu was at eight. His uncle then takes care of him from the age of eight until 25. And then I make the argument that every member of that extended family instilled in Muhammad وسلم, the child, the teenager, the adult, a, a particular value that really contributed to the development and the nurturing of his character. For example, he learned love and care and kisses and hugging from his mother Amina. He learned leadership skills and how to communicate with different tribes and adults from his grandfather Hashim because Hashim was the caretaker of Mecca. And every year when there was pilgrimage, he used to be responsible for providing the water for free for all the pilgrims. And you have to, you have to imagine how much water, and we are talking about sometimes scarcity of water here in South Africa, how he would queue the people in one queue, how he, would he manage resources? Who was watching all this? An eight, nine years, seven years old Muhammad seeing how his, uh, Hashim also presumably would have told him, oh my grandson, you were born in this year called the year of the elephant. I saw this year when Abraha came all the way from Abyssinia and he was about to destroy al Kaaba, And then he learns trade and merchant and traveling and he goes to Syria from his uncle. What's my point? My point is that unfortunately, children today, have a very limited experience because much of the experience they get are purely from their parents only. And the other, they get from the social media and from school and from the teacher. But where is the role of the extended family in actually filling up that gap which was given to Rasulullah? Where is the role of the grandfather? Where can we have today an adult saying, I'm grateful for my father for so-and-so, grateful for my mother for so-and-so, but for that particular skill, I'm grateful for my uncle, I'm grateful for my aunt. Now, and in the book I say, what about if the extended family is not anymore living in the same house? What if they are in the same neighborhood? Or what are if they are in a different city? Or today, economic conditions, different country? I say, I, I say that today nuclear families should utilize the advancement in social media. We have WhatsApp, we have video conferencing, we have all these kind of things. So you can contact your grandfather even if he is in India or in Malaysia or in Australia. Make it a point. And then you mentioned something earlier. You said grandparents, they are here for a particular time and after that they are gone. But even then, we can reignite the memories of the deceased by having an album. And why not, and a photo album, why not make a family tree inside the house of album, of photos? This is your grandfather, this is your grandmother, and make like a family tree. And every time, bring, once a week even, bring the family together and narrate a story about each photo or a single photo and come up with particular skills that this person was famous for. Your grandfather was famous for being generous. Your grandmother was famous for 
cooking this beautiful dish, which would take her hours and hours, and we would consume it in two minutes, but nonetheless, she was patient. And don't just tell the story, ha ha, we laugh and go to bed. No, what does this story tell us? It tells us about the importance of patience and discipline and commitment. And here you have an example whereby the grandmother that is virtual and that he has never seen except in a photo become a living role model for that parent. Jazakallah. Dr. Hisham, our time is literally up. I've got 30 seconds left, but I quickly want to squeeze in a beautiful gems that we have to appreciate. Um, often, and we hear the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi saying, this stage is for playing, this stage is for teaching, this stage is to be your child's friend. In about 60 seconds, just elaborate on that, inshallah. So in my book, Children Around the Prophet, which had just come out, I speak about treating children as if you are building a, a, a particular building, and every time you are adding a block, so the first block has to be the block of emotional block, love, rapport, um, emotional credit. This is where you, you allow them to play, mess around, etc., etc. And then the second block, you come and nurture them, teach them, advise them, give them feedback. And the third, you discover their talent and you empower them and you let them go, hoping that they will be better citizens, even far more better than you have been. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Hisham Al-Awadi. We appreciate your time here in South Africa. We hope you do come and visit us soon. Have a safe travel and all the best. Big, big shukran and uh, salama travel home. Thank you so much, Sister Hawa. It has been a wonderful interview and salam to all the listeners in South Africa. Wa alaikum salam. That was Dr.